Hello and welcome to Hired the Podcast. Today we've got Gary Miller, President and CEO of Miller Resource Group. Uh, 43 years in executive search, one of the uh, most prolific recruiters on the planet. Uh, tremendous expert at leading and growing teams of fabulous recruiters. We spend a lot of time talking about the current state of the recruiting industry, how weird the interview process is, and really how you can, how you can fix it just a little bit. Uh, try and help out candidates by talking about uh, how they can take control of the interview process and why they should. And we're going to finish talking about the industry that Gary is an expert in, uh, the current state and future of the industrial technology, robotics, and automation industry. So sp- sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Here I go, ready now, I'm coming for you, can't nothing stop me, I got some things I gotta do, Gary, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Really appreciate it. Um, let's tell everyone a little bit about yourself, your background, and, and frankly, why the hell they should listen to what you're saying. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that they, sh- they should, but uh, anyway, thanks for, for inviting me to be a guest on your, your podcast, uh, Travis. Um, I don't know. I think Every every story is unique, right? Um, no two people are alike. No two stories are alike, which is part of the fascination of our industry as I get to talk to people for a living about where they've been and where they're going and what's important to them and then to see if I can help. But, you know, 43 years ago, I stepped into this profession out of college by accident and um, have done the same thing or I've been in the same business. Uh, my job changes like almost quarterly. There's new people, new clients, new adventures. But it's uh, it's always been fascinating to me. And um, and the thing is that you know one of the traits of a good recruiter is empathy. You're supposed to have a a, a good appreciate what somebody's going through when they're making a job change. But I've never changed jobs, so it's I really don't know what it's like, um, but it's just been it's just been great uh, to grow up with an industry and technology and, and uh, meet so many people. The number of people that I've met and interviewed, I, maybe I could be in the Guinness Book of World's Records for talk to more people about careers than anybody. But that all goes into my uh, psyche in my being and and there's a lot of stories in there and uh, I try to just sometimes uh, synthesize, synthesize them and uh, use them to help other people open new doors. You said you found this career by accident? Um, yeah, it's a, a novel story, I guess. I mean, I was looking, a job I had obtained when in my last uh, semester of college fell through on my first day. And um, so I didn't have any clue what I was going to do. That was like in June, June 1st. Uh, My then girlfriend, now wife, her sister sold a copier to a firm in Oak Brook, Illinois, that placed sales people called Sales Consultants of Oak Brook. That's still our firm. And so I went there looking for a sales job. And they sent me on an interview. A couple of days later, I called back and asked for the recruiter. Uh, his name was Skip. And uh, I asked for Skip, and they said, Skip's not here anymore. He left the firm. And I said, who's taking Skip's place? Because I thought getting a job had something to do with where you were in line. And this job just opened up, and I was like the first one to hear about it. So they gave me a one-week tryout. And uh, I just kind of took to it. I enjoyed, it was nerve wracking at first because I didn't know anything about anything and I was talking to strangers. But I just was naturally curious about people and how they did that and what their company did and what that product was and how does that work. And I found myself being like, um, almost like annoying with questions, but people love to answer. Um, And that's how it developed. And um, I had the good fortune to have early success and then. The owner uh, 
Don Tobin asked me if I would uh, lead the firm or buy the firm 1985. And so I took over in 1986. It's been a, a great journey ever since. Yeah, so the story of how I got into recruiting is is different, but probably just as weird. And I think a lot about the uh, the great people in search out there, and a lot of them have weird stories about the, how they landed here. What do you think that is about the recruiting industry that draws the nomads and nomads and vagabonds to to find this career that they're successful in? You know, I don't I don't really know that. I think. Uh... You know, when it started, the industry started back in the 40s or 50s. It was like a local business model. You were an employment agency, and uh, people came into the employment agency, and the um, the agency actually sent you out on interviews. Physically sent you out on interviews, and it was just really a a, a people oriented job. If you had a nice personality or had some organizational skills. Um, you could pull it off. So it was very low barrier to entry at first. And it was sometimes like the people went to the employment agency looking for a job. And if the manager of the employment agency liked the person, they hired the person looking for a job. <laughs> so very seldom did somebody go to the employment agency looking for a job at the employment agency. But that's how it, how it evolved. And I think some people just found some some satisfaction in helping people get hired. Um, I'm not sure that's what the catalyst for why the industry took off, but that's how it evolved. The, the, if you think about it, the employment agency, its, its inventory is looking for a job. And so by just the natural cor- course of events, the owners of these firms see people who are looking for opportunity and when something clicks they say hey you ever thought about being a recruiter that's probably question that question has probably been the single question that has been asked more times to proliferate the industry <laughs> so 43 years in the business what's kept you in the business for so long and made you so successful um well success is relative i've enjoyed the heck out of it i mean like I said, I've met so many great people. I've learned a ton about technology. I, by accident, I was asked to place people in the electronics industry, which morphed into controls and then programmable controllers as the digitization of manufacturing uh, took place. And I got involved with robots and things like that. And you know, that my dad was an engineer, so I was always interested in how things work. And so asking companies to explain to me how their products worked and how they fit into the big picture uh, was, was really interesting to me. But I was also, hell- these people were also telling me their life stories. And, you know, say, uh, recruiting is a sales job. And my job was to interview salespeople. And so I got to interview hundreds and thousands of salespeople asking them what makes them successful, how they got to be successful. I got to interview hundreds and thousands of, of sales leaders, asking them what they look for in a great salesperson and why they're great salespeople seated. So if you're looking for just like, if you're talking years and decades of positive commentary about what makes successful people successful, and it's all going into my brain, it just, eventually it just kind of like becomes part of you. So studying success, studying performance is a byproduct of what we do. And then we get to make match people. We get to play, hey, you know what? I think you'd, you'd really match well with this company over here. And then to see them come together is a, a fascinating thing. I think you make a really good point there that, that recruiting is a sales job. And I think, uh, too many companies uh, haven't adopted that mindset yet. They still think that everybody, every candidate should be grateful beyond belief for the opportunity to come and work for their company. And so they're going to throw a job description out there, wait for 
people to come come to them begging to work at their company. And that, that's not the case. I mean, I don't know. You've been at this longer than I have. Maybe it was one day. Uh, but now candidates have choices. And the best companies know what sets their organization apart. They know why their opportunity is going to be a great fit for the right person or right people. And they're able to, they're either able to do it themselves or find somebody that can help them do it. And a lot of times really great companies do both, um, but they're able to articulate that career story and go out and, and talk to the best candidates out there and sell the vision, sell the journey and sell how this person is going to be a part of that journey. And they're grateful for the opportunity to talk to the best people that can help their companies. It's, it really is a sales job and it's not a, I, I kind of hate the term talent acquisition because you're not acquiring talent. That's your, you're finding and cultivating talent. And you, you gotta be. Nurturing talent. Yeah, that's a great comment. Talent acquisition, like I'm going to acquire you. You know, that's. Um, but I, I think that all uh, recruiters, corporate recruiters, you know, in the talent acquisition teams, I think they should, they should have sales training. Um, uh, it part. I, I I don't like the phrase numbers game, but clearly, the more people you talk to in any endeavor, the more likely you'll find the right person. Um, but it's more about, you know, selling is uh, finding out what the customer needs and then through questioning and then providing a solution. The, your earlier comment about a company's mindset of you should want to work for me. And you're lucky I'm interviewing you. I don't, I don't blame companies for that. I just think that's a bias that was formed probably back at the dawn of the industrial age and or around the, the great, first great uh, depression. Um, where you saw pictures of people lined up outside around the block, you know, men mostly lined up with their top coats on and hats waiting in line to get a job. And they were grateful to get a job, any job. And the clients, that was the ultimate employer's market, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, but there was a biases that were formed uh, as part of the industrial age. So, and it's really, as you study interviewing now and biases, um, a fabulous article by Malcolm Gladwell. It's written in 2000. It's called the new boy network, but it talks about, um, the biases that humans have and how just a glimpse of another person pretty much helps you judge your relationship with that person. Um, It's a fascinating article. I'd recommend anybody go look it up. But we have these biases and we can't help it because we're, they're biological. It's part of our survival instinct. You know, you're you're biased against danger and you are, whatever's the opposite of bias, you, you welcome comfort and safety. And so you're looking for, when you look at a, even a picture of a LinkedIn profile, there's something in your brain that tells you yes or no. Mm-hmm. Can't help it. And the interview process is so full of biases. And, it's, and I don't mean bias in a negative way. It's just part of your biology. So uh, trying to understand that, I mean, that's been part of my life for my whole life is, is trying to judge other people and understand why certain people click together and why they don't. What have you found out? Um, well, I think these biases have an awful lot to do with it, but you know, you know why you see stories of perfect resumes. Um, you know, people look at resumes and they go, wow, this is a terrific resume. And then they interview the person and they really want this to work out but it doesn't click. It doesn't work. And then somebody will meet somebody on an airplane. They'll sit and talk about anything and everything for three hours. They'll get off the plane and he'll say, Hey, do you want to come work for our company? And the person had none of the skills that they were seeking in the job description, but the chemistry was right. 
So I don't, I don't fully understand why that works. And I don't think any of us do, but I do know that what I'm seeing is the attempt to digitize that and just you know, matchmaking and scoreboards and things like that to, to try to um, predict perfect matches based on answers to questions and job descriptions and keywords and all that. Those are all uh, digital attempts to, to, to bring people together. But in the end of the day, it's the chemistry between two people and how they're reading each other and how they're viewing each other. Uh, there's, you know, some people would say, look, in a performance-based job, this chemistry really matter. I just want results. Well, okay. Um, but uh, to me, life's too short. Um, I'm looking for a, a, a joyful workplace. I'm looking for harmony. I'm looking for, because uh, I think when there is, well, this is not thinking, this is scientifically proven. When people are calm, when people are not under pressure, they do their best work. Mm-hmm. They have freedom to discover, freedom to explore, freedom to experiment. They do their best work. And when everybody's doing all their, doing their best work together, there's really no limit to what an organization can accomplish. Mm-hmm. They're limited only by their imagination and their ability to attract more people. Well, if you think about it, I mean, the, the interview process is so weird. I mean, if you equate it to dating, because it's, it's, it's a, almost as big of a decision. It's a little easier to change that decision a couple of years down the road. But I mean, when you're interviewing for a company and when a company's interviewing you, I think both parties ideally, in an ideal world, this is the company you're going to work at for the rest of your life. And both parties are trying to make that decision based on a couple of hour long conversations. I mean, could you imagine to meet your partner, your, your partner for the rest of your life, your spouse, you have one 30 minute conversation then you over the phone, then you go and, you know, sit down and have a cup of coffee for an hour. <laughs> then there's a, a panel interview where you go to their house and you meet their parents and their siblings, and then they make you an offer of marriage. It, it, it's crazy. Right. But I think, I think the, the interview process is shifting a little bit with, with uh, social media becoming more and more present and prevalent that, the interview process does become is becoming a a consistent lifelong journey. I mean, you're meeting people and engaging with them online with no intention of working for them, but you're building a relationship. You're um, becoming part of a tribe. You're getting to know so many people without ever thinking them of them as a candidate for your company or as a potential employer but it's like the three hour flight. You get to know them, you get to know their personality, you get to know who they are. And then one day your company's thinking of hiring or you're, something happens and you're thinking of changing a job. You immediately start to think of people that you know that are in your professional social network who you would consider for the job without them applying, without that awkward interview process. And the interview process is still happening, but I think it's probably becoming less and less important. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, to me, the interview process is really like the first six months of employment. And so you're just making a bet uh, based on a little bit of information, a couple, three hours of interviews, maybe an assessment, some feedback, some peer interviews and their opinion. You, you, You collect that information and you make a bet. And if you bet right more often, six months later, you found that you've got a great uh, employee. Yeah, I thought, think about that too, that uh, in, the, in courtship and marriage and whatnot, people spend uh, months, weeks, months dating. Then there's uh, engagement. Sometimes there's even cohabitation. And then yet the divorce rate is still like 50 some percent, even after all of that. Mm-hmm. So to have a two or three hour interview expect lifetime employment is, is pretty, 
um, pretty uh, crazy. But why do some firms keep, even with that, yet still keep um, people together or they keep them longer? And I, I think it's because that they know that they've got to keep evolving too. They can't be rigid with their thought process on, on onboarding and teams and structure. They've got to be flexible around with their people. Uh -huh. um, the, uh, I mean, they proved that back in, in uh, with the, the Six Sigma movement and whatnot, when the more employees were allowed to make changes and be flexible and make recommendations with the process, the better the quality, the better the outcomes. Even in a what was a very supposed you know, discipline uh, manufacturing process. So when an organization, uh, especially a service company or professional services company like ours that doesn't, I mean, it's infinitely variable, the opportunities we have to change things, to grow things, to try things, to experiment with things. And it seems like the more freedom we give people to figure things out, um, the better it gets. So I don't know, that, that was a long drawn out thought, but uh, I hope I, I brought some clarity to it. <laughs> so you're unofficially in the Guinness Book of World Records for having participated in the most interviews. Um, what, what makes the best interview process? How can, how can companies ensure that they're finding that happy medium of making the safest bet that they can, but not drawing it out to the point of, you know, 10, 15 interviews with dozen different people. Candidates hate that crap. And it's at some point it becomes uh, redundant and a, frankly a waste of time. What's the best interview processes look like for companies that are making the best decisions for their company? Uh, you know, that's, that's tricky. Uh, that New Boy Network article I referenced talked about the perfect interview process is so cold and heartless that nobody wants to do it. It's virtually impossible. To do. Um, you can't even really have conversation. In it. Um, so if I, so the, the, what I took from that is the, the best interview process would probably, at the very least, if you're going to ask questions about the, the candidates, Ask every candidate the same questions every time. Pay attention to the answers and see if you can look for patterns over time that candidates that answer these questions these way tend to do better than those. So, um, the, um, I don't think it was that article, but there, I read a different article one time about the best interview, the most popular interview questions, the 10 most popular interview questions of all time, uh, nine of them were not valid questions. Sure. They were just opinion questions. Tell me about your strengths. Tell me about your weaknesses. Tell me about your biggest accomplishment. Um, are you a team player? You know, these are all, what do you want to be in five years? These are all just stories that people tell uh, and through their lens and their, their opinions. They don't tell you anything about whether or not a person can do the job, only that they're a good storyteller or not. Mm -hmm. And the only of the top 10 most uh, uh, valid interview questions of all time, or excuse me, the top 10 most popular, the only one that's really valid is my favorite. And it's, tell me what you know about my company. That tells you so much about the research they've done, how prepared they were, and based on that research, what questions come up in their thought process about you know, your weaknesses as a company, your strengths as a company, your trends in the marketplace. If I had a candidate peppering me with questions about uh, our goals, our history, our, our biggest successes, our biggest failures, lessons we've learned, where the market's going, where we see our place in the market. I wouldn't let that candidate leave without trying to hire them. And then when I saw how they thought 
I saw how committed they were to, if somebody does research, they're showing you that they're willing to prepare. They're willing to go the extra mile. Uh, I can't tell you how painful it is to interview a candidate and, and then say, do you have any questions? And they say, well, no, not really. It just, it just like my heart just sinks, especially if I think they have some, you know, the right kind of personality. But yet if I said, you know, if I say, do you have any questions? And they say, well, hold on a second. And then they have 10 or 15. And some of them are relevant based on the research they did. You know, I researched recruiting firms and I noticed that there were 17 within DuPage County. How do you relate to those or things like that? These are thoughtful questions that shows me somebody's curious. They want to gain insights. They want to understand. Those are the kind of people we want to hire. Yeah, and I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier that, you know, com com a lot of companies still have the mindset that candidates should be grateful to work for them. I think candidates probably still in their inner recesses still have some inferiority complex that they should be grateful to work for just about any company. And, and they got to get out of their own heads and companies and candidates. They got to realize this is a two way street. This is as much about the candidate interviewing the company as the company interviewing the candidate. If they take the responsibility to ensure that this is a good role for them, this is an organization that they can thrive and that they can be successful in. But I don't understand why the, the burden of interviewing primarily falls on the company. I think, I think candidates got to take ownership of it and take responsibility for at least, I don't want to say taking control, but um, being an active participant in the interview and not just uh, a reactionary answer machine. They got to figure okay. it out for themselves too. Here you go. You just invented the reverse job fair. So a great candidate rents a room at a hotel and he invites companies to come by and interview. <laughs> <clears throat> but that's the, that's the mindset you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, how do candidates do that? How do they, how do they, how do they take control of, of the interview and doing their best to ensure that the companies they're talking to are the best fit for them? Well, I think, I think it's one being transparent about that um, and to say, okay, I look forward to, uh, if I was a candidate going into a company, I'd say, hey, I'm really glad to be here. I look forward to speaking with you based on everything I've researched. Um, it looks like a great place to work. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes. I'd like for you to start the interview, if you wouldn't mind, by telling me what you're looking for. Tell me what a great employee looks like. Tell me what you want this person to accomplish. Tell me what uh, people in this job have, what have they become while working for your company? Where does a successful candidate go after they're on the job? What, uh, tell me about the most successful employee you've ever had. What made them successful? And if an hour later, I'm still being inundated with questions, that candidate did, did take control of the interview process. Mm -hmm. The person that's asking questions that's in control. Candidates need to learn how to be better questioners. And, you know, like, again, you're thinking about going to work for this company for a long time. You're looking to invest your time in this organization. Your, their compensation is part of your return on your investment. So is your fulfillment, your growth, et cetera, et cetera. There's no reason why you shouldn't, the candidate should not take charge of that process right out of the gate. But they've never been educated on how to do that. Hmm. But I think if you're going, you're going to, you're thinking about, making your bet on this company as the place you're going to invest your, your time and effort. What's the return going to be for you? What's in it for you? And I think candidates should just be transparent about that. Hey, Mr. Employer, if I come work here. What's in it for me? 
uh, an employer that would be offended by that, <clears throat> uh, that's, that might be too radical. I think good employers are willing to sell to a candidate if you come to work here. Here's what's in it for you. Um, but I think candidates, if candidates learn, learn to ask better questions and take a really strong interest in what it's like to work there, their curiosity in the interview will naturally make them a more appealing candidate. It's a hard skill and it takes some, uh, takes some guts to pull it off. And a lot of them don't have that mindset. You know, I, I, I guess uh, I heard it, I used to hear it a lot in my early days when I was questioning clients and our, our intake calls or our job order calls or needs analysis calls. I heard it time and time again, the employer would say, geez, you have a lot of questions. Does this ever end? When does it end? <laughs> <clears throat> How much can you know about another person? How much can yeah. you know about the company? Yeah. All right. So shifting topics a little bit here, Gary. Uh, so this business has kept you in it for 43 years. If somebody's thinking about this as a career or, you know, we talked about the, the happy accident of people falling into this business. Why should somebody fall into this business? What is it about this business that's been so great for you? And why should somebody consider recruiting as a profession for themselves? Well, um, <clears throat> I read something recently about uh, the definition of a catalyst. Like if you have hydrogen and nitrogen and you put them together, nothing really happens. If you add iron, you get ammonia. But if you look at the ingredients of ammonia, it has no iron in it. The iron just helped those two come together to form something new. So that's what I've done for a living. Is I've helped two people meet, facilitated their connection, their relationship grew into something hopefully significant, and I'm not part of it anymore. So it's, it's a really uh, great feeling. You know, it's funny, I was doing this for a couple of years, and my mom said, Gary, are you ever going to get like a real job? Like, are you ever going to? And I said, Mom, my job, she said, are you going to ever figure out what you're going to do? <laughs> I said, Mom, my job is to help everybody else figure out what they're going to do. I'm kind of like the genie in the bottle. I get to make, make people's wishes come true. And what a, what a gratifying career. But again, everything I've learned, the, the journey I've been on, the companies I've helped uh, grow, uh, it, it, to look back in the rearview mirror and see that you helped a company hire dozens of people. And then over time, you saw that company. Um, influence in industry and to know you were that catalyst that made a lot of this happen is ridiculously gratifying um you know you talk about finding fulfillment in your career uh that is not something i'm lacking and then to to, to teach other people to find that same joy it's i always think about you know did you ever see like the first time you saw a really great movie and then you, you took somebody to see it. And you're, while you're watching the movie, you're looking over and you're kind of like, this is good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> good. And when they're finished, they go, you were right. That was an awesome movie. That's the way I feel about this career. When I'm able to introduce somebody to it and they find the, the joy that I've had, again, the things I've learned, people I've touched, the companies we've helped, the industries we've affected, and all of that, I got to watch my kids grow up. I coached Little League. Uh, I don't have to, a lot of corporate travel. Um, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. It really has. Let's talk a little bit about the industries you have affected. And you, uh, you specialize in industrial technology process automation, and you've got a, another team you, um, that specializes in food and beverage manufacturing. What's the current state of the industry? How has it been affected by the state of the world? And what do you see as the future? Sorry for such a big question. Well, uh, I feel really lucky. Uh, you know, in the early days, we would specialize in anything. You know, <clears throat> we worked um, every vertical, every industry, mostly sales positions. That's, that, that was our original moniker, but our 
<clears throat> sales managers we helped, a lot of them got promoted to be executives. And then they started asking us to help them find directors of engineering, manufacturing, whatever. So we broadened out. That's where we changed our name to Miller Resource Group. We were more generalized. <clears throat> but still, we specialized in, in cons consumer hard goods and medical devices and software and, and electronics, construction, civil engineering. We've, we've specialized in so many different things. And part of our journey, our evolution over 50 years now, has been deciding what to peel off and what not to specialize in. What's been left is what we feel uh, we're fortunate to, to be uh, left with. Uh, you helped with the moniker of kind of farm uh, to table, but you know we have a food manufacturing and production. I think we're always going to continue to want to eat as a society. Innovation in food production uh, and whatnot is part of uh, what we're working on, including agriculture and and the work done with uh, better plant science and better uh, animal science to help feed the planet. Then we get into the production side of it, and we work with the manufacturers and distributors of food. So stable, solid, huge industry needs talent. On the automation side, <clears throat> especially with uh, the pandemic, I mean, automation and robotics and process control and things like that were, were growing anyway. The pandemic just accelerated it because if people couldn't be in the factory, and we could still make the factory run with fewer people, then we were going to keep the production lines moving. So the, uh, the interest in automation, the need for automation has grown significantly. And, you know, people say, well, automation, there, there's a big school that uh, says automation robots take jobs away. No, they replace jobs. They change jobs. People that are doing uh, monotonous uh, tasks that in many times are unsafe, those people can, they have an opportunity to be retrained, reskilled, do other things because these robots have to be purposed, programmed, installed, taken care of, maintained, cleaned, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, we feel like you know, food manufacturing and the production of goods uh, is necessary for the world's sustenance and automation uh, is helping the world produce it in a more efficient uh, and safe manner, in a uh, cost-effective manner, so there's more for everybody. So it's like we're trying to take care of the planet here. And these industries um, are, are front and center there. So we, we're just fortunate that this is now our specialization and our passion is to help these industries grow by helping the companies in it. Mm -hmm. So, and we, we are try to, we try to be advocates for the industries too, because, you know, young people coming out of school, they've got options. They could go into banking or finance or whatever. And we're trying to make sure that they know that food and food science and food manufacturing and automation and robotics and process control and, that those are all uh, interesting fields where opportunities abound. And wherever we can get the word out like that, even if we're working with local high schools or colleges, uh, we're advocates for the industries we specialize in. Hmm. That's great. Um, anything else on your mind, Gary? Anything else that you want to talk about today? Uh, <clears throat> you know, 66 years old, I'm as excited about work as I've ever been. So I'm looking for some reverse aging uh, pills because uh, I feel like <laughs> I want to keep going. But no, seriously, I mean, uh, I still have a lot of energy around it. I enjoy watching other people learn the industry and, um, and find the success and the fulfillment that I've had. And while I have the energy to do so, I hope to continue uh, supporting you, supporting them in, uh, you know, in building this enterprise for what we feel is a very, very good cause. Well, Gary, thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Please make sure to uh, subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to them. And if you liked what you heard and wouldn't mind leaving us a rating, uh, we'd really appreciate it.
Well, thanks so much, and good luck out there, everyone. I'm making a move. Sun is shining on me. I see.